Alrighty, I'm going to show you how to make one of these, an AR to AK-47 stock adapter. This only works with an underfolding stock for a milled AK-47, and it mounts onto pretty much any AR-15 that has a standard receiver extension and lower receiver. Unless you've got some really weird buffer tube or something on it. Alright, so I'm going to run down the materials you need. Materials you need are a piece of 1 8 thick flat bar. Um, it can be hot rolled steel or stainless steel. I happen to have uh, 4062B stainless steel because that's all they sell at the Lowe's Home Depot and Tractor Supply at me. This is a 3 inch wide piece. Um, if you can find a 2.5 inch wide piece, it'll save you one extra cut. And you're going to take this and cut it into a four and three quarters long piece and then into a two and a half piece. And then I'll go over all the other cuts you need to do after that. You're also going to need one screw. Now the size and shape of this screw don't really matter too much, but the one thing that does matter is that this head needs to be half an inch in diameter and it needs to be a domed head on it as well. If possible, um, you want it to be a, less than a quarter of an inch in length. This one is a half inch in length, so I had to cut half of the threads off in my final product here. And I also had to take about a sixteenth of an inch of material off the outside of the head. But other than that, that's all you need. Alright, and for tools. For tools you need a hacksaw or a reciprocating saw with a metal blade on it, a set of punches, a tap and tap wrench. Uh, the tap needs to match the thread pattern on your screw. This happens to be a one quarter shank with a one quarter um, NC set of threads on it. So that's what I have to match. Also, the tap needs to be a taper. I mean, you can probably get away with a plug, but taper is best. Alright, you're going to need a nail punch, uh, a set of fine files, or at the very least, a 3 16 round metal file, a step bit that goes that has at least 1 quarter and 5 eighths on it, a 1 8 inch um, standard bit, HSS, and a 30 millimeter or 1 and 3 16 um, tungsten carbide hole cutter. Now this is specifically designed for cutting stainless steel, which is what I have here. You might be able to get away with a cheaper one that cuts regular steel for using hot rolled, but I mean this was $9 from China. So, I mean, might as well pay the extra buck for a stainless steel one. Uh, pliers help, they're not critical. Uh, caliper, digital or dial. Um, that that's a lifesaver. That'll make all of your measurements way easier. Hammer. And, of course, you need a Milserp underfolder stock kit. Uh, this is a Hungarian AAMS Milserp underfolder. I got this from akbuilder.com, I think. Uh, they just cut the rear trunnion off the back of a decommissioned AK-47 receiver and sent me that, which was great because I also got the rear trunnion, which I could get all of my measurements off of. You also need a Dremel. So um, if you have some hardened steel bits, those are money, and you also want like a 3 16 inch um, file bit, stuff like that. Now into the big stuff. Uh, you also need a drill press. I mean, you could do this with a hand drill, but I mean, this, this is... This will save you so much time and effort. I, I got one from Harbor Freight for 50 bucks, so there's no excuse. Um, some sort of clamp. I like the uh, C-clamp vise. You also need a vise block for your drill press. And you need a circular belt sander. Uh, the three inch also helps. And what's really nice is this one inch vertical belt sander. Also, you should already have one of these to begin with because every American should have a table vise, but you need a table vise, uh, at least a four inch one. Uh, you can probably get away with a three inch one, but you want ones with some, with some heft to it. You also need a work table to mount it to, or something, or your, the side of your car, or a 
block of granite, something like that, whatever the hell you have. I don't know, just staple it to your dog or something. That's all the tools you need, really, and you can make one of these yourself. Uh, it's quite a bit of work. Um, the most time-consuming stuff is getting the folds right and doing all the final fitting. But that's what I'm going to show you, and if you've got the patience and the tools, you can make one of these. I, I may patent this, and I may start manufacturing and selling these, but I mean, if you've got the tools to make one of these, you can make one. So, the, really the only thing that's stopping people from manufacturing these is the patent. But, I don't really give a shit, because I've got a career in a completely unrelated field, and I just want to see my baby thrive. I love you, baby. Let's get to the actual working on this. This is cut to four and three quarters. And it's going to be cut down to two and a half next. Alright, so I got that cut. Um, note on the hacksaws. This thing way faster. Uh, shakes the shit out of the work table, but it does it in a fifth of time. And the cuts are cleaner, which means I spend less time on the belt sander, which means I use up less of my belts. So I'm going to pop this bitch on the belt sander because there are some nasty burrs on there. Well, not that bad, but... So in between every hacksaw cut, I'm taking it to the belt sander, or I'm quenching it outside in water, taking it to the belt sander, deburring it, and grinding it down to tolerance, and then I'm taking it back outside and quenching it in water, just so I don't burn my hands or accidentally harden the steel. I don't know. I don't know anything about metallurgy, so don't listen to me on that. Alright, well I got this bottom cut, and I've already deburred it on the sander, so now it's time to cut these two corners off. Alright, so it has wings now, and next step is I'm going to cut these V-notches right in here on both sides, and that's just to uh, allow the metal to fold uh, closer into here, because otherwise it'll be too wide and it won't be able to fit the um, mounting hardware on the AK stock. Alright, V-notches are cut, last is the little notch up here. If you don't cut that out, then the back of your palm hits the bottom of this, and it's just uncomfortable and everybody has a bad time. So it's better just to cut it off. So this one is a little more hairy because I don't really have a good way of getting that out other than doing some interesting hacksaw work that involves cutting out various V-notches at, at progressively shallower angles until I can get the hacksaw flat under it and then cut it enough that I can cut a piece off and then I can just cut all of it out. But it works, and then I just have to clean the ever-living snot out of it with the one-inch vertical belt sander. But it works. Uh, if you've got a much better way to do that, do that, because I would highly recommend doing it. I could also just drill some pilot holes and work with that, but uh, I'm fucking lazy and I'm not going to do that. Alrighty, that was the last of the cutting. Now I just gotta sand down this hunk of crap and fold the wings, drill the holes, do the final uh, filing and sanding and fitting. And it'll be done. Alright, now that it's nice and shiny and clean and deburred, it's time to bend the wings. Which involves pretty much just clamping it sideways in the vise, just like that, and just beating it over. We're shooting for one and three eighths um, width. Really no rhyme or reason to this. Just line it up with the bottom of your V cut and just smack the shit out of it with a hammer. And then get the two lined up, measure them with your calipers, and if it's 1 3 and 1 3 eighths, good. If it's not, find the side that looks the shittiest, unfold it and refold it. And just back it in or back it off in the vise. Alright, first one's bent. Uh, that one went pretty well. It's a little um, tilted, but that's no biggie. Uh, when you drill, all of that will be fixed, and if it's not, you'll fix it all in filing. Alrighty, after letting my OCD run rampant for 30 minutes, we actually have the final shape. So now the last, well, second to last step is drill the holes. Now, time to get comfy with our good friend, the drill press. I went ahead and I took my nail punch and I marked all the centers for each of my holes. And just to clarify, this is going to be a quarter inch. This is going to be a 5 eighths. This is going to be a quarter inch. We're doing the exact same thing on the other wing, except 
there's going to be a 1 8 at the top of this 5 8 and a 1 8 at the top of this 5 8 You don't have to drill that, but I mean, if you've already got it here in the vise, you might as well just use that eighth inch bit to drill it. You could do that with a file or a hacksaw or whatever you want, but I find drill bits just easiest and then dremeling out the excess. Another note, uh, you want to be uh, aware of the um, RPMs of your bit while you're doing this. Uh, for all of this, I'm going to do 1200. Um, you could go faster for the one eighths. You could probably you could do two thousand for the quarter inch, but mine only does. Uh, mine is only a three speed. I've only got six hundred, thirteen hundred, and three thousand. So I'm just going to do thirteen hundred and everything, except for this. This big boy that's going to be done on the six twenty setting because you do not want to get that going fast because you'll break a bit. And remember, keep it oiled. If you don't keep it oiled, it's going to burn. You're going to burn up bits, and it's just not a fun time. Okay, well, I got the holes for the AK assembly mostly drilled. Now I'm going to do the 1 8 holes on the top of the 5 8 Now, I'm just going to eyeball these because they don't have to be very precise. They just basically have to be about an eighth high and an eighth wide, and I'm going to work these a whole lot with the Dremel afterwards, so it don't have to be that precise. It's I would just have it so that they just barely don't break through into the 5 8 hole. Alrighty, I got that done. I can already tell it's a little bit off center, so I'm gonna have to clean that up a good bit with the Dremel. Mostly, this is gonna have to come down a little bit, but that's no biggie. The next step is drilling the hole in here to be tapped. Then after that, it's just the one and three sixteen. Alrighty, now slap that bad boy on a block of wood, pop her in the vise, start hole cutting. Now that the hole has been cut, look at that. Beautiful. I mean, it's really disgusting looking, but it's beautiful to me. Alright, now on to the next step, which is tapping. Now, the size um, tap and screw you use is really doesn't matter. It just needs to be a half inch wide. Approximately. Can't be any more, but it can be a little bit less. This is what um, keeps it from rotating on the back of the receiver. It holds it in place on the receiver. It's better if it's exactly a half inch. So you just want to tap this hole right here, put the screw on, put it flush. Uh, if you want to be a little extra snug, you can put a half inch wide washer on here too, but it mm, doesn't really matter too much. And once you get it tapped, uh, you can cut this off to however much you want. So. It won't really interfere with much. I think this one will interfere, maybe a touch here. But really, as long as it clears these big holes, you don't really have to worry too much. So I might take about three threads off of that. Now, the last step is fitting. And this is the uh, most patience taxing part. You have to basically individually fit this center support, then these two pinholes, and then all four of these. And then you're going to have to fit this. This one's not too bad, the big hole, because all you really have to do is just dremel the outside of it, then take your um, receiver extension and just shove it in there until it fits and doesn't actually touch it. You don't want any sharp edges on that because your receiver extension is aluminum, and this will gouge the hell out of it. Alrighty, well, all my fit and finish is finished. So, give you a rundown on what I did. I did shorten that screw about four threads just so it wouldn't interfere because the back end was hitting these interlocking lugs. And let's see, trembled out those, expanded all of these up to the sides. Let's see, took a little bit out of here, beveled this. Took a little bit out of both of these. Beveled these, I think I already said that. Anyway, that's all I did. Now it fits just perfectly. This clears the a buffer tube of an AR-15. These clear the center support of the underfolder stock. This side clears the interlocking lugs. Just fine. And this clears the outer locking lugs. And this clears the inner pen, but uh, you take my word for that. So yeah. There you go. It's done. AR to AK buttstock adapter. 
I say it wasn't so hard. It just took like a half dozen specialty parts and four hours of your time for a gimmick that you can show your friends at the range and they can go, wow, that's stupid. And then everyone will spit on you and then you'll cry and run home. But hey, you made it and you can feel proud. I mean, I get to feel proud because I invented the thing, but I mean, you can feel a little bit of pride because you got you made one. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. Alright, real quick, I'm going to run down how to uh, assemble this with the AK underfolder stock. This is a Hungarian AAMS Milserp underfolder stock. I think I picked it up from AK Builder for 45 bucks delivered. They're not cheap anymore. You can't get them for 15 bucks from Sportsman's Guide anymore. No Polish ones anymore. It's, yeah, sad. But hey, whatever. So first step is you're going to want to take the stock, make sure you have it the correct side up, put it on here. Flip it over, take your interlocking lugs, find the side that does not have these cutouts, and slap that bad boy through these holes. Once you got that done, I'll get my arm out of the way, and then you drive the center support. Or you fuck it up and bump the stock off. Drive the center support, make sure these holes are lined up. Push that just through the other side of the stock. Then what you want to do is you take this outside um, nut. guess that's the best word for it. Some type of nut. Uh, then you take the outer locking lugs with this inner pin. Put that through, keep the slot vertical. Don't drive it all the way through, and then you take one of these pins, pop it in here, should get enough clearance, let it go through, push it into these little cutouts you did, pull this back out, tighten this nut down. I'm just going to get it hand tight. Alright, that's close enough for this demonstration. And then after you got that, make sure both of these lugs lock up, flip her over, Take this spring, pop her in there, take this button, keep this whole vertical, pop her in there, depress it until all three of those holes line up, and then, just to make sure that everything works, I like to take a 330 seconds brad nail, pop it right through the pinhole, and then from there I can test it for function. There it goes. It's stiff, but it works. Uh, this brad nail will make things a little janky because it's thinner than the actual pin, so you have a little more play on these interlocking lugs, so they'll like to stick. And also, don't be surprised with how stiff this stock is. It's not because you did a shitty job. It's just because this spring is way too stiff for what it needs to be. I guess it's mil -cert or military grade, that's why. Yeah, so then just uh, press this button a lot and have it uh, fuck up on camera and then you're done. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, once you're completely done, you're going to put one of those 1 8 um, pins through there and one through all this back here underneath, or through the button. And through the back end of this, yeah, through the back end of this, through this, and through the button. Alright, last up, I'm going to show you how to put this onto the back of an AR-15 receiver. So, first step, take this, drop it, then pop it on here, take your extension, get the thread started. Alright, now that you've got that done, you're going to want to take that out, turn it around, uh, put your spring back in for your takedown pin, lined up, pop her in place, and then using your third hand, rotate this around until you get the hole for your buffer retention pin lined up. Put the buffer retention spring back in, put the detent back in, press it down, Drop that because you just don't care at the moment. Tape. Get. Yell at it some. There you go. That's back in. Spin this back around. Get your detent spring depressed. 
just, you know, call it some mean names or something. It'll get depressed eventually. Um, yeah, there you go. Now it's on there. Yeah, shit works. I don't know why it would fuck with the trigger control group, but, you know, it works. All right, one last thing. I would highly recommend not using this on a um, 223 or 556 rifle because this drastically changes the recoil, um, the axis of the recoil on your rifle. In a regular AR-15, the receiver extension acts as the um, guide rod for your buttstock, which pops on right here. And when the bolt recoils, it goes directly into the buffer extension, and all of that recoil goes directly backwards. That's why this is allowed to be aluminum, and this is allowed to be aluminum. And the only steel component right here is your end plate and your castle nut. But because this stock mounts down here, your stock is now about an inch lower. In fact, it's exactly an inch lower, so your bore axis is now down here. So over time, if you're shooting, you know, 5.56 five, out of this, your recoil is, your muzzle flip is going to be noticeably higher because instead of recoiling directly backwards, it's going to flip a little bit because the recoil is going to come straight back like this, but your stock is going to be here, which is going to cause it to tip upward. And over time, that can put strain on the back of the receiver and on the castle nut on these threads on the buffer extension, particularly right here on these threads. And that'll just cause it to strip all the threads off, and then your end plate will blow out or something like that. Castle nut will become impossibly loose at all times, and you can never tighten it. And if you've got a very nice buffer tube, uh, that's going to suck ass. However, this is some piece of shit that I got for $25 off of Cheaper Than Dirt. No, $23 off Cheaper Than Dirt with a buffer spring and a buffer. So I do not care. Plus, this is a 22 for me. So I use a CMMG 22 long rifle uh, drop-in conversion kit on it. So I don't have to worry. I, I would think this would be uh, okay with 9mm, maybe 45 lowers. Um, but I would definitely... I would definitely not do it with 5.56. You might be able to get away with it for a short period of time with 2.23 or 300 blackout. Yeah, so just be careful with this on rifle rounds. Uh, you might might break something here or here. But if you're using 22 or probably 9mm, you're probably safe. This isn't rocket science. It's gunsmithing, sort of.